yes, um, Dennis can get started with the pre-meeting announcements. Great. Welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the partnership grant committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you'd like to comment during the meeting, please use the raise hand feature. To raise a hand, to use a raise hand feature by your phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad and raise your hand. And to use the same to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the meeting. All committee meetings will be recorded and posted up to the state bar website. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Zoom captioning is available. To enable, select live transcript on the bottom of your Zoom screen and then in, select and not enable auto transcription. Thank you. Okay. We do a, should we do a roll call? Uh, yes. Um, one second. All right, Iskin? Uh, here. Bashali? Here. Galkin? Cruz? Sorry, my mute button kept going on and off. I'm here. <laughs> um, Lee, Lee? I don't see Joe quite on the call. Uh, he's, he's running a little bit late, uh, Crystal. OK, no problem. Uh, Justice Rodriguez? Here. Judge Yang. And then I'll go through our liaisons and presenters. Uh, Selena Copeland, uh, Laura Brown. Here. Melanie Snyder. Here. Um, I also see Zach. Is Zach on the call too as an attendee? Um, uh, yes, and he has his hand raised. I'm gonna allow him to talk. Go ahead, Zach. Hi, everybody. Zach Newman here from LAC. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, State Bar staff. Um, I think we can skip this part. Uh, it's, it's Dennis and myself uh, as the, the main staff today. Okay. Do we have any members of the public here? Uh, so, so Eric, we actually have um, folks from uh, both Sierra Lay and public council. Uh, this is uh, and uh, to answer the uh, any of the committee's questions uh, when we get to the uh, agenda item later on. Um, just referring to you if you'd like to um, have them speak now, or we can wait until we get to that agenda item and, and have that discussion. Well, yeah, for CRLA and public council, if you wish, you can defer your comments until we get to the relevant agenda item. <clears throat> it, does anyone wish to make a comment now, any member of the public? No one is indicating they want to speak. All right, hearing none. So do we move on, I guess, to um, the approval or review of the uh, summary of the action items from the last meeting? Any comments yeah. on that? Hearing none, a motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Also move. I'll second it. All right, and I could take a roll call vote. Bashelli? Yes. Galkin? Cruz? Yes. Lee? Uh, Iskin? Yes. Motion passes. Crystal, what's our next agenda item? So our next agenda items is uh, regarding updates for the 2023 and 2024 grants. Um, I can share my screen and, and um, go through, through, uh, okay. through these as well. Please. Okay. <clears throat> Are you able to see my screen? Um, There's a slight mm -hmm. delay. One second. Oh. Okay. Let me try that again. We did see it clearly. Um, okay, let me try to share the screen again. Okay. 
All right, so this is agenda item five. Um, I'll, I'll cover both 5.1 and 5.2 together. These are updates regarding the 2023 and 2024 partnership grants, more of an administrative update. Um, so just a reminder, wanted to have um, all of the, the current uh, and upcoming funding opportunities on screen for reference. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, PG 2.0, for the, the new PG 2.0 monies, uh, that grant is continuing on until the end of December 2023. Our 2023 partnership grants uh, just started on January 1st uh, of this year and will be concluding at the 12th month cycle also on December 31st, 2023. Uh, 2024 partnership grants, that's where we'll be um, looking looking ahead and looking forward. As a reminder, on the November 16 Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meeting, um, the commission met to approve the uh, proposed RFP and updates to the scoring rubric. Um, after following the commission's approval, uh, we have since updated the RFP and we'll have that available um, and posted uh, on, in January 2023 uh, when we will release the application. Uh, I, I believe at this point, all of their grant agreements for 2023 uh, were, were submitted on time um, and uh, the ex anticipated disbursement uh, is, is, is some time next month. Um, uh, again, uh, for 2024, this shows you through June, April through uh, June 2023, we'll have the application deadline, which is typically in March, uh, also trying to uh, do additional follow up uh, or outreach to uh, potential uh, applicants. Uh, application mm -hmm. review will be around um, April and then various meetings from May through June to get the uh, recommendation and approval process um, uh, having that carry on. Uh, July 19th, these are all the placeholder meetings. I believe you all received calendar invites um, for, for these tentative things. These are just the purposes for these meetings. And then as mentioned, PG 2.0 in 2023 um, are both scheduled to end at the end of this year. Uh, any questions? Okay, um, does that conclude your, your report on that item, Crystal? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have a couple of requests to change the scope of partnership 2.0 grants that this committee uh, needs to look at and approve. So why don't you go through those, Crystal, if you could. Sure. And um, just a clarification on agenda on 5.3. Uh, this item is listed as request for both uh, partnership grant 2.0 project services. Uh, as a clarification, uh, CRLA's request is actually for their 2023 uh, partnership grant, which again, uh, as mentioned, start, started January of this year and will be ending December 2023. So the first request I'll go over first is from Public Council. This is their PG 2.0 new project, the Appellate Clinic Expansion. Um, as a reminder, this project provides uh, pro, pro se indigent litigants with assistance um, uh, representing themselves on appeal through the use of tools and technical assistance. Uh, proposed changes uh, are summarized here. And then I believe also um, Emily is, is, is in our attendee in case there's any additional questions the committee may have. Uh, changes uh, are to establish an attorney-client relationship uh, with the self-represented litigants. The purposes would be for short-term lim limited counsel and advice, and they would uh, public counsel would also run conflict che uh, checks when a, uh, a self-represented litigant protects the clinics. Uh, they anticipate that the conflicts will be uh, rare uh, in instances. Uh, public counsel also wishes to increase language access uh, and the appointment time availability uh, and had mentioned ad additional mm -hmm. updates uh, for data entry for um, having secondary evaluation methods. Uh, staff recommendation is to approve all of these changes, but um, welcome any questions the committee uh, may have. I, I, have, I have a couple of questions. Well, first of all, what is number three? What does that mean? Data entry for secondary evaluation methods. <laughs> I had the same question. Thank you. Maybe, and then Emily probably will be best. I tried to sort of truncate um, the, the information, but um, Emily, if you could uh, provide additional context, that would be great. And I believe she has her hand raised, Kim. Thank you. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Can everyone hear me? Oh, hi, okay. Um, so I... I believe this is just that we had submitted um, like a follow-up interview mm -hmm. under on the list for the secondary evaluation method. And we simply wanted to change that to meaning pulling uh, cases from our database and doing case review. Um, so I think that's 
as Crystal mentioned, like, I don't think we would have referred to it as data entry. We do mean case review um, as our secondary evaluation method, as opposed to follow-up interview. So what, 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 what kind of case review will you be doing? Um, so that would be pulling. Um, we recently transitioned to a database called Legal Server, and via Legal Server, we can pull all of our case notes um, rather than having to follow up with applicants who we've either lost touch with or who we only saw at the clinic once or twice and um, have not seen them since. We would be able to review those case notes um, to evaluate uh, the success of those services. And I have one more question, then I'll shut up and let somebody else ask them uh, if, if anybody has any others. Um, so the attorney-client relationship uh, will only be for kind of pre-filing consultation. In other words, I, I assume that public counsel will not be representing the the uh, uh, the client actually in filing the briefs or doing oral arguments. Precisely. Argument. Yeah, we had an out. We had a outside evaluation done of the clinics, and I think that they just flagged that at times, um, you know personal information is shared in our initial consultation and um the and that establishes that client attorney relationship but we are explicitly clear that we are not uh creating a long-term client attorney relationship it's only in in relationship to the cases pre-filing yes do you help with drafting of the briefs uh no i believe that if we got to the point where the drafting uh would come up we I could double check with the directing attorney, but she told me that that would be the time where we would refer them to more extensive services away from the self-help clinic. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Just on uh, number three, a follow-up question. So is this uh, analysis of kind of the notes that are in your database in lieu of a secondary evaluation that would be sent out to the client? Like instead of? No, we will also be, we do uh, distribute uh, client surveys. And so we do receive those. I think the, the concern was simply sometimes those surveys do not get returned to us. And so we would want to refer to the case notes that we kept um, on those clients uh, if the surveys are not returned, basically. Got it. So it's a in addition to as yes. opposed to an, instead of. Understood. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So I, one more question on that, and sorry not to beat a dead horse, but I, I tend to kind of get anal about evaluation. Um, so you're going to look at the case notes, and okay, so what, like, how will you know? Just as a general example, like, how will you know if your intervention was successful from looking at the case notes? Yeah, I think that the case notes would contain. Mm -hmm you know, similar information to what we would hope to glean from the client survey of whether or not they felt that their issues were resolved, what the next steps were, et cetera. And as I said, it our initial survey that's distributed does cover that. There are just instances where we just never see those clients again, but we took notes to know that, you know, yes, they filed their appeal, like they intended to file their appeal on time, or yes, something, uh, transpired as expected successfully, but we would not have the client survey to prove that, but we would have case notes made by the uh, attorney who staffs the self-help clinic that would indicate those answers for us. Okay. I mean, that sounds good to me. I'm just curious, did you, you say that you would refer the litigant to more extensive services if they actually need representation and drafting the brief and all that. Does public counsel provide that kind of service separately through some other funding or or are you saying you would have to refer them to private counsel i think it would depend on the circumstance and i'm not the directing attorney so i just want to make that clear um i'm just speaking on behalf of her um i believe we would initially refer them internally to public counsel but not via this funding right they would not be receiving help under the appellate clinic funding um, and if for some reason they couldn't be referred internally to another member of our consumer rights and economic justice project then we would refer them externally or to one of our pro bono partners okay well thank you does anybody else have any questions i had a one follow-up question Will they be appearing as a attorney of record anywhere? And something we've 
looked at in the past? No, not to my knowledge. Again, the establishment of the attorney client relationship would only be uh, for that sort of initial uh, counsel and advice uh, portion. I do not believe the attorneys would be appearing anywhere. Thank you. And I'm glad to motion if we're done with questions. Well, I would, Crystal, do we want to, we have two items, right? Yeah, yeah. so um, I can do, I defer to the committee, the recommendation as written has them combined, uh, but uh, would we, would we want to go through CRLA's proposed changes and then determine if separate motions are needed or as, as the proposed motion, um, if that would work? Why don't, why don't we go to CRLA, talk about that one, and maybe consider them collectively. Sure, so the second request for proposed um, uh, request for changing, updating the proposed uh, project scope is from California Rural Legal Assistance. This is for their San Joaquin County Housing Helpline Help Court Partnership. Uh, again, uh, a clarification that this is for their 2023 partnership grant project. Um, uh, it is not a PG 2.0 new project. Uh, also, this grant will end December 31st, 2021. Uh, a quick uh, description is that this CRLA provides uh, one on one legal advice and information to tenants with housing issues, and they hold a weekly answer and trial preparation clinic available for clinics and mm -hmm. landlords. Uh, proposed changes um, are here, and uh, I believe uh, Monique and perhaps another staff member from CRLA um, are also present to answer any questions from the committee, but I will read this out loud, out loud and if I uh, mischaracterize, as I may have done for the previous slide, uh, corrections are, uh, are very welcome. So first change is to expand project scope to provide advice on the college rights, access to CRLA's KY uh, Know Your Rights Library, and if there's uh, time, uh, draft letters to landlords asserting tenant rights and negotiate directly with landlords prior to court proceedings. Uh, CRLA would provide this assistance under a limited services agreement uh, and would ensure that clients are aware that their status as self-represented litigant and any court proceedings remains unchanged. Um, they also, CRLA is also requesting an update in its staffing structure from a, a 1.0 FTE, a housing helpline law graduate um, that would now change to three part-time paralegals at 0.5 FTEs each, who will be directly supervised by CRLA's housing helpline senior counsel. Uh, the paralegals would answer the calls three times a week, research and draft forms for callers. Uh, when no staff, uh, when um, not staffing the helpline, update the library resources and then lead live Q&A clinic sessions. Uh, two, two days a week, they will also handle in-person intakes at a CRLA Stockton office. A staff recommendation uh, for these changes is to uh, approve. So, uh, again, I'll, I'll just lead off with a question. I mean, I'm, the first bullet puzzles me. I mean, you it says expand project to provide advice on the caller's rights. I mean, wasn't that what, what the project was about originally? I believe the distinction, and, and Monique or, or anyone else from Sierra LA, uh, please feel free to chime in, is the, uh, the limited services agreement that self, uh, that, that aspect to, to the proposed uh, project. Um, let me take a look. Is anybody from CRLA on the line? Yeah, Monique, Monique Tiller's here. Um, Kim, could you unmute her? Okay, I let me try to do that on my end. Hi, um, this is Monique Tiller. I'm the grant writer at CRLA. Our legal director will be joining in a moment, and I think she can provide a little bit more details on the um, on bullet point one uh, and the scope of those services. Um, and I just, just want to address bullet point two. Sorry, I know you had the question about the first one, but it would actually be moving um, the three part-time paralegals. Um, two of them would be at um, the... 50% half time and the other one would be at um, a quarter half time, so 0.25. Okay. 0.26. So that's very small, but that's the one difference. Um, and that was just to address um, we had a the original um, staff person moving on from the organization and we found that splitting it to three people would be a little bit more effective. Um, so yeah, there's that. And um, did you see Aurora Tome was the legal director. Should be joining us. Do you see her on the line? I'm sorry, I can't see all of the participants. Um, not, not, not quite, not yet. Okay. Um. So let's see. But yes, they. 
sorry, could you repeat your question? I apologize. No, I was just curious. I mean, the, the proposed change, this is characterized as a change, which to advise the clients on the caller's rights. I mean, I, I guess I would have thought that's what the project was about originally. I don't know why that's an expansion. It doesn't, it's not obvious to me why that would be an expansion. I think it was more the desire to be able to do things like draft letters um, to landlords um, and things like that. They were providing advice, um, but it was just in the clinical model of meeting with the clients um, over Zoom and they were pretty brief meetings. So it, it's more just those, um, maybe it was poorly worded, but those additional services. So would the letters would the letters be um, signed by an attorney from CRLA? Is that the idea? Uh, yeah. So they'll be supervised by um, the um, by one of the attorneys um, who has supervised this project. No, no. But my question is: Would the letter, this drafting of letters, is are you drafting a letter for the client's signature, or is the idea that CRLA would actually be sending the letter on behalf of the client? Um, I apologize. I'm not sure about that distinction. Um, hmm. Do you have any questions about the second bullet point? I, I'm sorry. I don't. Is it anybody else? I don't. Um, I, I will say, uh, I'll chime in as well, because uh, as Yerley had reached out previously, and the, my recommendation was that they submit their proposed changes. So I believe this paragraph is slightly updated to what was originally submitted in the 2023 application, um, and the drafting letters aspect is, is probably the, the, the biggest change. I believe in our conversation, and I'm keeping an eye out to see if Aurora joins too, is I think the thought was, um, the thinking was having the letter uh, on CRLA letterhead uh, would uh, maybe hopefully be more um, impactful or um, yield a, a better result. I don't know in terms of if they're signed, but then then signed by CRLA, but I remember uh, the letterhead being an, an aspect to, to the, the, the letter, um, the, uh, drafting the letters. Um. Okay, and Aurora's jumping on now. And yeah, it should be on Sierra Lay letterhead. That's correct. Um, but she'll be joining in the second. Uh, on the second bullet point, the paralegals will be leading the uh, Q&A clinic sessions. And will that be supervised? Yes. Yeah, they will be supervised by um, an attorney. Okay. <clears throat> Are we still waiting for? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping out. As, as soon as I see her, I was going to unmute her. So uh, I'm keeping an eye out. We have a relatively light That's agenda, just letting folks know. So <laughs> we're, we're okay on time. On the, also on the second agenda item, it's going to be the in-person intakes are at the office of CRLA, not the courthouse, correct? So... In the past, we have just been doing it um, at the office, but the court has requested that um, CRLA start coming into the, at the courthouse once a week, so they will be doing both. Okay, so it'll be intakes once a week at the courthouse mm -hmm. and then once at the office. All right, I believe Aurora's on the, on the line here too. Um, Hi, Aurora. Um, we, Hi. Were, uh, we were asking um, Monique some follow-up questions regarding CRLA's proposed changes. I believe specifically, um, Eric wanted to know the, dis, um, the more about uh, bullet point one and sort of what the differences are with what was originally submitted um, uh, in the in the the, app, the 2020 application. Great. Sure. Thanks. And, and sorry for um, joining a little late. Um, our, so for bullet point one, uh, basically, we just wanted to make sure we had, um, I think, talked to, um, we have, we sometimes have staff, um, quite a few of our community workers will, um, in other cases that we have, will do a little bit mm -hmm. more um, than we had, I think, initially proposed in our scope of work. So, um in addition to just providing the advice and the information, they will actually negotiate directly with landlords and um, 
and actually write demand letters, sometimes on CRLA letterhead. So even if we're not going to represent the person in court, so they're still a self-represented litigant, um, we find this can be really helpful either to prevent eviction cases from being filed in the first place um, or to try to resolve them without a, an attorney having to be involved. So we just wanted to be clear that we that we would be okay to do that slightly higher level of service um, and still have it be counted under this grant since we know this is for self-represented litigants. Um, and uh, you know, I know they're, they're still going to be self-represented under that definition. They're not going to be represented by an attorney in court, um, but we would have some, you know, we, we would like to be able to make calls on their behalf to landlords and say we're, you know, we're representing this person for the purposes of negotiation only, or we're writing this letter, you know, for the purposes of negotiation. So um, we wanted to just make sure we're in compliance with the statute and everything on that. Um, so. Yeah, no, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I don't have any quest, further questions. Does any, anybody else, anybody on the committee have any further questions? I uh, have one follow-up question. The paralegals will be calling the landlords or is this some other volunteer no, so this is yeah. They're they're essentially the and and I'm using community workers is what we call them. They, and they are they are sort of analogous to paralegals, but yeah. The, so we do um, we have them making the calls um, to landlords, especially when landlords are unrepresented by attorneys. Um, uh, it it has worked out for us to have them um, you know to call directly with the landlords, and then um, then those paralegals are supervised by a a CRLA attorney. Gotcha. I think I understand. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. And this is Joe Lee with a, a follow-up question to that. And thank you for the, the helpful explanation. So if the landlord does have counsel, I'm guessing that you'd probably have the um, the supervising attorney handle any interaction as opposed to the paralegal. Is that right? Yeah. In those cases, we would usually do that. They're <laughs> the attorneys. I, I, yeah, I think it's better if they have an, a, an attorney to um, to mostly be having the the attorneys deal with it. We do have a few local attorneys who who will be responsive and who we who we know pretty well and have okay relationships with who sometimes we will have um, a paralegal contact them um, just with a with an offer, but that's pretty rare. Got it. All right. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. And by the way, about 30 years ago, I did my first pro bono case with CRLA. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Right. Fond Great. memories. Yeah. Great. Great. I hope you won. <laughs> we um, So it was, a. I don't want to take people's time, but it was a lawsuit against an, um, uh, a farm, basically, in Somis that was enslaving people. Literally had barbed wire and would not let them leave until they paid off the coyote. And uh, there was a federal law enforcement investigation. It was the first slavery prosecution since the Civil War. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So we 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 got a very nice settlement for our, about 27 clients. Great. Great. Are there any... Uh... Okay, so we have now the uh, descriptions of the project scope changes for both public council and CRLA. I guess we can now move on to the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, can I just, I just wanted to just clarify one thing, Monique, that I said, I heard at the tail end. Um, we are going to be doing um, intake on site at the CRLA office. And then the court has also asked us essentially to provide like a, a workshop service at the court once a week. So we hope to actually have both of those, both some intake for walk-ins at our local office, because sometimes people are used to walking in instead of calling, and then um, also also have them going to the court, because the court has asked us to do that. So hopefully that doesn't really change the <laughs> the um, the the idea of, of what was said, and I think that fits in with our original scope of work to provide um, sort of clinic or workshop settings. Okay, thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to the resolution. Uh, so we, I guess we need to change this because there's a reference to 2.0. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one is to, one is a change to 2.0 and the other is a change to 3.0. Uh, 2023. Uh, Approves request from Sierra Lady. 
say I'm trying to figure out because so, so, so wait so the public council request is to change its partnership grant 2.0 project right yeah and the CRLA request is a to change the scope of its partnership grant 2.3 project it's um or whatever it is whatever whatever the whatever the number is for the grant yeah okay let's read that uh, requests from okay all right any other wordsmithing anybody wants to do before we put this up for a vote all right i'll move that we that we adopt this resolution. Second. Okay. Um. I'll. I'll. Um. I'll ask a roll call vote. Uh, Bashelli. Yes. Belkin. Cruz. Yes. Lee. Yes. Biskin. Yes. All right. Motion passes. Crystal, I have, I have a question. I mean, these scope changes struck me as relatively minor um i'm just curious what why do we have to approve these yeah so so as the committee knows when the committee when the committee reviews the the pro the applications they're essentially project proposals um and you know subject to, to changes or, or tweaks because both projects had reached out um and there's also that element of the attorney client relationship uh staff thought it, they mm -hmm. would defer and bring these to the committee just to make sure um everything was okay and all questions were answered there are some changes that definitely that that do happen and are, are sort of within the context of what has been submitted but because there was some variation we decided and there was a january meeting uh, we decided to just get the okay before the start of this whole the 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 rest of the the grant term. So it sounds to me like it's a matter of the, the staff exercises its judgment as to which changes seem kind of important enough to merit a committee discussion. Uh, somewhat. We haven't done this before, though, too. So um, also, like PG 2.0, the new projects are very long scope, 21 month project. So we wanted to make sure that everything was fine, sort of carrying on the, the bulk of the, that grant term. And 2023, the project hadn't started yet. So just just flagging it. So maybe some staff discretion, but also um, pr uh, proactive <laughs> and on for the grantees reaching out to us and informing us of these uh, proposed changes. Uh, okay, do you want to move on to 5.5? Yeah. Oh, Eric, uh, before we move on, could I make a small request? Sure. Um, I know that our current instructions are generally no representation. An attorney may not represent, but we've also let, allowed, I think it was Legal Aid Marin, do limited representation, including in front of a judge. I'm wondering if we should revisit that. I don't know where that rule lives. Um, but I think it's very helpful that sort of negotiation and making sure that you have confidentiality and allowing that level in the initial application of um, interaction might be useful. And I don't know how we would need to modify our rules, or I don't even know if we have a rule or if it's just a, an application modification, but I would like I guess, Eric, you to consider whether that would be a worthy change. I don't know. Do we even need to change anything in order to accommodate a uh, partnership grant request that would that would contemplate this kind of limited scope representation that we've seen today? Um, so, so currently in the the RFP, there there is a a, a slight a small paragraph about self-representation and the attorney-client relationship. I don't know uh, what that would mean for the application changes. And um, Melanie, I know you're on the call too, so if you'd like to chime in, feel, feel free to do so. Um, but it, it is in the RFP, and that's why we, we permitted some of the projects, just taking a closer look of what that attorney-client relationship looks like. Um, and in the application, grantee uh, applicants are, allowed, are permitted to say yes and then provide more information um, about that. So. so you're saying that under the current 
RFP, the way it's framed, applicants are permitted to include within the scope of their proposed project some let, limited scope representations. Let me share just the RFP that I'm looking at so everyone can, can know what I'm, I'm referencing, but it's this uh, this paragraph here. Uh, I think these some of these policies, especially in the last page of the RFP, um, have carried over, um, mm -hmm. and maybe the, the next round of applications, we could take a closer look at some of these policies, but the, um, this is here and included in all of our RFPs thus far. Well, we, we don't have to address it now. I, I just wanted to put it on the table for later. Well, I mean, it looks like it looks like uh, um, applicants are already permitted to offer the kind of services that we discussed today. And, and the only reason we discussed them today is that I guess the original the original scope, they didn't say that they were going to do that. But now they are. But they could have said that they, they could have proposed to offer limited scope representation as part of their original grant. So I'm wondering if some of the problem is that the partnership is with the court and um, and the court has to maintain neutrality and is it becomes problematic if they're partners with someone who is representing only one side of a case. And so uh, I suspect that's where there's some issue maybe here. Um, uh, and I'm also thinking, of course, you know, the issue of representation um, before the court, uh, the issue of, you know, is the attorney on the hook or is this a self-represented litigant um, needs to be a line that's clearly drawn for the court just so that they know who's who to send the pleadings to, who gets served, all those issues. Um, and so I, I'm again, I don't have the background that Bonnie had, but um, but I would think those are some of the issues that are important to the court that might be uh, underlying a rule like like this one that's developed here. OK. So moving on to the next agenda item. Um, Emily, Monique, and Aurora, thank you for, for joining. Feel free to, to stay into the call, uh, but we are uh, moving on to the rest of our agenda items. Okay. All right, so the, um, this next item 5.4 is approved delegation of authority for 2022 partnership grant budget revision and carryover requests. Um, just as a reminder, the deadline uh, to submit uh, these requests uh, is January 31st, 2023, um, highlighting that this deadline actually got pushed back. The committee has historically um, reviewed um, budget revision and carryover requests around its November meeting, uh, but we were trying to permit additional time uh, for grantees to sort of close their books to see if a carryover is requested. Um, and I believe budgets, budget revisions are coupled with that. Uh, currently, we have two pending requests. Uh, they, they have not been submitted yet, so I don't have additional information. Again, they do have until the 31st to, um, to, to submit those requests. Uh, historically, the Partnership Grants Committee um, has not approved carryovers, uh, but there have been instances um, when a project was not reapplying for funding. Uh, however, uh, there has been flexibility in recent years uh, pursuant to the grant agreement terms, grantees with approved carryovers for 2022 uh, may be approved up to a six month spend down period ending June 30th, 2023. Uh, there's an asterisk there, but I'll, I'll revisit that. Uh, the approval process just depends on the percentage um, of the change of the request. Uh, under 10%, that is a self-executing request and the grantee does not need to request, uh, request a change of, uh, from staff. Uh, 10 to 25 percent staff has the uh, authority to review and approve those requests and then anything over 25 percent um, needs to get reviewed by the committee uh, and then approved by the legal services trust fund commission uh, just looking at the calendar our next committee meeting is not until april 6 2022 so staff recommends that uh, the committee delegate authority to an ad hoc working group to review and develop recommendations on behalf of the committee um, and present that at 
present those recommendations at the March 24 Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meeting. It's, logist, um, it's mostly logistics in terms of the timing. We typically do not get a lot of requests of so, um, estimating probably less than five, um, but just for the timing wise in lieu of scheduling um, another meeting just for purposes of reviewing these requests, uh, staff thought it would, it would be um, probably more efficient, uh, more, uh, uh, more expeditious to have an ad hoc working group formed instead. So th this would only be relevant if and when we get requests for a carryover of more than 25%, right? Because for requests less than 25%, this committee doesn't have to approve them. Correct. And we don't even know if we're gonna have those at the moment. Correct. It's a lot of unknowns, but uh, we are meeting today and our next meeting is, is until April. So it's anticipation that if, if there is a, a request, uh, at least one request over 25%, uh, that we do have, um, we, we can be in touch with uh, two, at least two of the committee, or two committee members uh, for, their, uh, for their recommendation. I have the motion here. I can flash. I can go back to the previous slide, uh, but this would uh, just be the the motion. Again, the ad hoc group may not be uh, working group may not be needed, uh, but we just need something in place. Uh, in if in the instance the request is over twenty five percent. So if we adopt this resolution, what will happen is you will monitor the situation, and if by January thirty one. Uh, there are no requests over 25%. <clears throat> we have nothing to do. If there are, you'll just uh, tap the shoulders of the one or two people in the ad hoc working group to say, hey, we got two requests. We need to meet next week, uh, you know, whatever, something like that. Yes. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Oh, sorry about that. So moved. Second. Thank you. Not saying that. All right, I'll, I'll just, we'll call the vote. Bashelli? Yes. Salkin? Cruz? Yes, and I nominate everybody else to be on that ad hoc. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well played. Um, with well. <laughs> well played. Uh, Lee? Yes, but I'm opposed to Ms. Cruz's uh, amendment. <laughs> uh, and then Iskin. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Um, and then, um, as Anna mentioned, we, we do need two, um, two, two members uh, or one. I don't, it's, it's up to Ali. Uh, it just has to be below three. So we don't have to notice the meeting. I, I think Ms. Cruz would be the perfect uh, member. <laughs> I, I agree. I'll raise my hand just because I was stupid enough to make the original uh -huh. amendment. <laughs> I'll be I'll be happy to be the other one. Okay, so wonderful. Dan and Eric, okay, you may not hear. I will just uh, send you an update regardless if there's nothing to do or if we need to schedule a follow up. But I'll be in touch after the January 31 deadline. Sounds perfect. Thanks, Crystal. All right, 5.5. Uh, 5.5, .5, presentation on the mid-year 2022 partnership grant evaluation data. Um, I will take the lead on this, and I believe this may be our last agenda item for the day. So the mid-year partnership grant evaluation report, uh, just noting that uh, there are two reporting periods that um, occurred and are captured under this uh, specific report. We have the 2022 and PG 2.0 supplemental. Um, the evaluation data looked at uh, requested information from January to June 30th. Uh, the PG 2.0 um, new grants, uh, as, uh, as you may, uh, I don't know if everyone recalls, but that grant started April 1, uh, 2022. And because the, uh, the mid-year was the June 30th point, they only reported on three months of data. A key find, um, so what I'll be presenting on are just sort of key findings based on the major evaluation report submitted. Uh, again, this is the halfway point for most projects, but for PG 2.0 new projects, this is really three months in. So um, I'm anticipating that once we get annual report data, the numbers will be much higher and we'll, we'll be able to see trends. Um, I mean, we've seldom had a chance to look at reporting data um, this early on. So I wanted to use this as an opportunity to just sort of share out what uh, we found. 
Um, the key finding with our mid-year partnership grant innovation reports is that uh, most, most projects use remote services for uh, self-represented litigants uh, in one-on-one -on -one and group setting services. Uh, this change is, is pretty significant as uh, remote services were not previously used and it's uh, we're anecdotally attributing to COVID-19, which uh, really necessitated remote services. Uh, projects funded. So in 2022, 6.46 million was distributed to 51 projects. In the first six months of 2022, organizations spent about 1.48 million of the distribution amount. That's 23% collectively, but this chart here provides a breakdown of the 2022 PG 2.0 supplemental as well as the PG 2.0. Oh, 2022 and PG 2.0 supplemental and then PG 2.0 new. Um, as you can see, there are different trends happening for the different group types. Uh, those grants, the one in the first uh, row, first column, are ended on December 31st, 2022. So as expected, the percent of amount um, grant money spent is about 43%, uh, um, about 50% for other projects, which is not surprising. And then PG 2.0 new, new projects who were in their first three months of their grant um, had an, an average of about seven, 7% uh, of spent uh, spend down, which makes sense. It uh, could be uh, attributed to um, the projects just starting up or they're needing to be uh, them projects recruiting during the first three months of, of the grant. Uh, we received these numbers individually uh, by each project. Um, so staff is also following up with grantees who reported um, perhaps some, some are over or under um, the average expenditures just to confirm that they are, are on track to meet deliverables. Um, and in instances when there were under expenditures that they had a plan on to spend down the remaining grant funds. Oh, Eric, are you muted? I don't know if you're trying to say something. Yeah, sorry. I mean, are they on track? Because that 7% does seem pretty low. Yeah, and so um, as a reminder for PG2.0, it's a 21-month grant. So uh, a lot of a lot of the, the issues in terms of why it was less than 10% was just recruiting. They had to find uh, folks to meet that, fulfill the position for the, 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 the expanded or the, the, the large scope project, which a lot of the PG2.0 new projects were. I, I anticipate um, we'll, we'll be getting the annual 2022 annual report data, um, I believe in, in March, around March or April, um, but that number should significantly increase, uh, uh, assuming that um, all the rest of the projects were able to recruit uh, successfully. Any questions about this slide? I, I'll, I'll move on um, if not. Well, when, when is our next committee? I mean, when, when will we get a report on the full year? Uh, so the annual evaluation report, which is January through December, it'll cover the full 12 months. That's not due until um, end of March, um, and but we do need some additional time for analysis. So, analysis, so it would be late summer, early fall uh, to see the numbers. So it'll slightly miss the um, application review cycle. Like it won't, the, this data won't be available, won't be available or like analyzed um, by the time we start review of the 2024 partnership grant applications. Yeah, I, I don't know. It just seems like um, it's too bad because I, maybe we can adjust the time cycle on that. It seems like we should have some information about the prior year when we're analyzing the subsequent year, since many of these projects apply just to re-up. You're here. <laughs> really frustrating that we don't have that. I third that. Yep. Yeah. What, yeah. what could we do practically to adjust for that? I mean, Crystal, is there a is there a fix to kind of push it so or to push the applicants? I mean, so so just from our, our, our total like grants administration cycle and how that runs. So the grant has to end right December 31st, 2020 something. Um, so we, we release these evaluations around January, uh, but also during January, we're asking grantees to report on their prior year evaluation data across all of the grants. So it's a very crunch time. Um, another piece to the grants administration cycle is that partnership grants is the first sort of set of grants that gets uh, released in the grant year. 
Um, and that's that's intentional because we have IL to EF following plus the other discretionary grants that that um, that follow. And um, so, like, the, I don't know, like, what if what the resolution is. We can discuss that further. I can, I can um, ask ask Duan for any thoughts too. Uh, but just the the cycling of um, when evaluations are due plus when our grant application cycle happens. It's 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 always tricky so the the best we're able to do is present on uh like two years two years prior or or something like that um so when we're evaluating the 2024 the applications for 2024 the most recent full year evaluation data will we have we will have will be for 2021 uh yes yes It's unfortunate for this specific year too, because I feel like 2021, a lot of the courts were still closed and a lot of service providers were sort of in a different um, <clears throat> kind of operation mode as well. So it, it, I think it'll be a, an especially hard year for us to understand. Crystal, I was under the impression that by the time we were making final funding decisions, the evaluations were in. So maybe I'm misremembering. So we, the committee makes final recommendations around um, May or June. Uh, I, I'm also, you know, our analysis is all in-house. So we're also struggling with sort of having capacity, staff capacity to do the analysis of the data submitted by, um, you know, 30 plus, gran 30 plus uh, grantees plus the 100 IELTS EF plus the 50. So all of this happens in-house in too, which is why there we do need a few months for um, to, to sort of synthesize the data before we present it to the, the commission. Um, but yes, I think preliminary numbers could be available. Um, I, I probably have to revisit that maybe with Juan and Elizabeth to see like if there's certain aspects to the evaluation report that the committee may want to see, maybe that could be a compromise, but it wouldn't be the full report. Like I think realistically, I, that wouldn't be um, available until like late summer, early fall. And that would be after the committee makes its final um, recommendations. Well, I think we should look at that figure out some way to get information to the committee at least some of the information key information you know like the, the number of people that they projected to serve did they meet what? that metric that sort of thing um we should have yeah, maybe that. maybe what we can do uh eric is is we can talk offline um and uh and then kind of focus them in on sort of what key metrics we would like to see and perhaps sort of put more of the onus on the applicants too, because I know our staff members are are juggling a lot as well. I mean, if that that, that would be helpful, just reminder for Bagley Keen, like just keep it to two, um, just we don't want to do the hub and spoke um, and be in, in, in violation. Uh, yeah, we might be able to provide like some sort of smaller sets of data, but I'm just like the full analysis. I don't. I'm the, the lead for our evaluation efforts. Like we, we have a lot of evaluation data that we need to get through and it's a very high priority uh, across all of our grants. So, you know, just trying to be um, realistic uh, <laughs> and just uh, uh, with, with, with expectations, so yeah. Yeah, D Diana, just just the talking offline is a great idea, except as Crystal noted, Bagley Keen is a real impediment. We frankly, yeah. it's really hard to do that, which is really um, annoying. Um, my, my high expectations are also very annoying. No, no, no. I mean, I think I think they're good. I mean, I wonder. I'm. Mean, I'll just throw. I mean, Crystal. I. You know, I know you guys have a lot to do. But if the only way we can have a discussion is to have a formal meeting that's noticed, maybe we could think about having a special meeting. You know, just to just to brainstorm about this subject. Um. What we could do is um, our next meeting is in in April, April six, and at that point we would have at least have the submitted data, I can provide sort of what the template of the evalu the evalu evaluation report and what that looks like. And if the committee could identify three priority areas or data points that they, they'd like to see by the next meeting, maybe we could do that. I don't know how, how that sounds, but we can probably loop it into, we can fix a sort of discussion or 
um, have that at the, at the next meeting, if that right. helps. I think that's, that's a good suggestion. Crystal, what, um, I, I recall the applications have evaluation data, yeah. but this is separate evaluation data, or is it yeah. the... So the applications um, have an evaluation um, section, which is sort of responsive to the, the rubric, like the rubric category. Um, and then we also have the, admin the administration section, I don't know if you recall, has all of the anticipated project goals. What this evaluation report has is what was actually done. So the proposals provide us like what the plan was and the evaluations provide us with what was what had happened during the grant year. So it provides the the end the end cap, if you will, of the grant year. And like, uh, you don't think the applicants in their application could bring that more bring that report more to fruition and provide that data? Uh, so they're proposed so the, currently I'm trying to think ahead because I know our application release is, is, in, is in a few weeks. So like feasibly what we could do. Right. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to make it too <laughs> difficult. I was just trying to come up with an idea that wouldn't be too onerous for everybody. But if it's, if it's, if it's, if there's a tight deadline right now, maybe it's not something for this application period, but the next one. Yeah, po possibly. I mean, could, we could look at, we could look at that all, all together. Um, but I, I think there is some some sort of ground, middle ground we can come to where we have some sort of information instead of having to, to wait for the two years. Uh, but if we want to put that um, on the, the April meeting, we, we can do that and have a, a more lengthy discussion. I, I think the current evaluation section of the application tends to provide fairly dated data. I, I could be misrecollecting that, but I don't. Rec I, I recall being kind of dissatisfied with what they put into that current section. Yeah, I recall it being, see, feeling at least anecdotal more than like we met these project goals. Yeah, but. and and the application has been updated to include sort of the updated rubric category description in which we're looking at uh, evaluation plans moving forward as well as if it's a continuing project how how evaluation of the project has been and how successful it's been in meeting the goals and hopefully will yield better um, responses to the section um, but there's definitely room for improvement and we're sort of making incremental improvements this timing thing though um, I, I, I do think we need to address somewhat uh, at our next meeting Okay, Crystal, you could move on. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so just highlighting um, the partnership grant services, the, oops, the top three focus areas for the projects uh, for the first six months or first three months for PG 2.0, uh, unsurprisingly, housing, family, uh, and then domestic violence and civil harassment. Across all projects, uh, self-represented litigants sought the most assistance in obtaining information on general court processes and procedures, obtaining information on substantive legal options, and then document preparation or review. Uh, in addition to providing one-on-one -on -one services, uh, partnership grant projects uh, held a total of uh, 1,000 1,048 workshops uh, where 2,413 litigants for assistance. And just to note, uh, one of the 2022 projects closed during the reporting period, um, and they have since uh, returned uh, their unspent grant funds. Uh, this was reported in the mid-year, so we were informed of this and then have gone through the steps to, to close out that project. Uh, this is for our, um, Central California Legal Services. I don't know if Recall the specific name. They have several projects, but it was uh, from that uh, specific uh, grantee organization. Okay, um, so I believe this is my my last slide. Oops. Uh, just a breakdown of the individual services and number of individual individuals served, uh, as well as the group services provided. Um, for the annual evaluation report, we're going to try to address the the numbers in the in the top chart. Um, I believe in the application. Maybe most of you recall that there was some potential double counting because if a workshop covered multiple. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just talking about the group services. If multiple people had. Um, either attended multiple workshops, they may be double counted. We're going to try to. Um, clarify the question just to see uh, so we can get a more unique number uh, or a more accurate number of the number of unique individuals served uh, by partnership grant projects.
All right. Well, um, <laughs> I think that's it. If there's not any questions, I wanted to just highlight. Uh, we we had to. Um, the reason why we had this mid-year reporting um, was because of the the change in reporting requirements on the state budget act. Uh, and there was something with the timing um, in which we had to have. Um, we decided to report on the first six months of data. Uh, moving forward, uh, I believe this is the last instance of the mid-year uh, valuation report. Uh, moving forward, um, all other partnership grant reports will be um, reported on an annual basis um, as they as they typically are. Well, thanks, Crystal. Appreciate it. Thank you, Crystal, for all your hard work. I hope yeah. to hear from you in April and not the end of January. Yeah. You'll, def you'll definitely hear from me um, after January 31st, though, since um, you and Eric are part of the ad hoc working group for the budget revisions <laughs> and carryover requests. Yeah, I would also second the thanks to Crystal for all her hard work and Job. Is there anything? Uh, gosh, we might actually adjourn. What two uh, two hours early? Is that right? Oh. Wow! All right. I had, I had one one small thing, Eric. If you would allow it, <laughs> it's it's not a big oh, thing. Oh, you're you're cutting out, Will. Uh oh. I'm just mm -hmm. kidding. <laughs> He's a winner. Uh, so I just wanted to offer a, a brief apology to our, our chair and staff. I did my homework on the rubric changes. My gut response had been that it was going to disproportionately lower the scores of rural grantees because of a because there'd be a difference between 16 point spread and a 10 point spread. And while I was technically right, I was not right in the way that matters, which is meaningfully. Hmm. They, uh, there's one point difference, but as far as the ranking goes, yeah, I was wrong. And I, uh, I just wanted to uh, apologize to, to staff and to Eric, because while I, I hope I would have done the analysis beforehand, if I had had more time, I didn't. And then I wasted everybody's time. And that's one thing I uh, don't appreciate and wanted to rectify that. But if anybody wants my spreadsheet, I'm glad to share. Um, uh, Will, no apology necessary. Appreciate all the work you're doing. And, you know, thank you for your comments, but, you know, and for your participation. Well, everybody is working really hard. So I want to make sure I acknowledge it and acknowledge when I've uh, made a mistake that may have cast aspersions on that hard work. So that's all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. I believe this is the first of our Legal Services Trust Fund Commission and committee meetings. So um, Happy New Year. Uh, I'll see you either at the March Trust Fund Commission meeting or our April 6th uh, committee meeting. Happy New Year, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank New you. Year. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. Well.